So first of all, many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to this very interesting conference and the great place. Um, let me start mentioning that although the talk is to a big extent a, a review of large time behavior, the more recent part in the work is uh, jointly with my postdoc Franz Achleitner, with Eric Kahlen, and with my former PhD student Jan Erb. So let me first set the stage and define the goals that I will have throughout the whole talk. I will discuss various evolution equations where the operator L is assumed to be constant in time. Also, I will assume that uh, this operator L has a unique steady state that I will denote by F infinity. So the overall goal, goal will be to describe the large time behavior, or more precisely the convergence of the solution towards the steady state. And I want to estimate the norm of the difference to that steady state, possibly uh, in form of an exponential decay that we can estimate this with this exponential term here, uh, and the difference at the initial time Possibly even with a sharp exponential rate and with a sharp, I mean the maximum uh, constant mu here in the decay estimate. And uh, even better it would be to also have the smallest possible multiplicative constant here in front of that, all uniformly for all possible initial conditions. The main strategy will be that for the various equations that I will look at, we want to construct uh, problem-adapted uh, Lyapunov functionals. I will denote that with some E, depending on the solution and the steady state. Think of uh, a norm squared or an energy or entropy that will depend on the problems that we discuss. And then we wish to uh, derive some differential inequality of this form. Once we have that, the Gronwald lemma will give us an exponential decay in the form that we want it to have. So let me start with really simple things. Let me start with the following ordinary differential equation up there, where I assume that this matrix C is typically non-symmetric and constant in time. Um, and I will make the following definition. I will call this matrix C coercive if it satisfies this inequality for some positive constant kappa. So this means the symmetric part of this matrix C should be positive definite. And let me start with a very simple two by two example. Let's look at this matrix here. So you immediately compute that the eigenvalues are one half plus minus some imaginary part. So with this minus sign here in front of the matrix, you see of course that the decay rate for any solution of this equation uh, will be one half. Uh, on the other hand, this uh, matrix C is not coercive uh, according to this definition. The symmetric part has one and zero. So if you just multiply this ODE, say from the left with the vector U transpose, uh, you will not get uh, immediately an exponential decay of the Euclidean norm. So here you see a plot. This blue curve is the Euclidean norm as a function of time. And what you see it decays in this wiggly way. Uh, and what is uh, bad, what is the bad feature, that at points like this and this, you have horizontal tangents, and it's exa exactly because of those times that you cannot easily get an exponential decay estimate. Uh, but if you consider rather this modified norm uh, with a matrix P, uh, matrix P being for this example, this guy here, then you have this nice red curve which uh, uh, behaves in a convex way and decays exponentially. So for that it is easier to derive an uh, exponential decay estimate. So the main theme will be 
uh, how do we construct such a matrix P, or in more general, um, how do we find uh, Lyapunov functionals? So here's the outline of my talk. I will discuss three blocks in my talk. The first block will continue on such simple ODEs. Then I will switch to partial differential equations. In particular, I will start with some kinetic relaxation equations. And again, discuss the large time convergence to the steady state. And the third part of the talk will be concerned with Fokker-Planck equations. So let me first define what I mean with a hypocursive uh, ODE. So the more normal definition or more normal word would be a matrix C is positive stable. I will call it hypocursive to have the link to partial differential operators afterwards. If uh, the, the minimum of the real parts of all eigenvalues is positive, and uh, if the matrix is such that none of the eigenvalues uh, are defective, then you have an exponential decay or exponential decay estimate for all solutions of this simple ODE with a rate that is mu, which is the minimum of um, all the real parts. And note that typically this decay rate mu will be larger or equal, so that's the spectral gap of the matrix C. This will be larger or equal than the constant kappa, which was the spectral gap of the symmetric part. So to connect the spectrum and the decay rate, I want to look at the following very simple lemma. So let me just uh, briefly graph uh, the spectrum of such a matrix C because we will need that. So here I'm in the complex plane and I want to just illustrate the spectrum, all the eigenvalues of the matrix C. So I say there is a spectral gap, so there is this vertical line here uh, with the value mu, and the matrix up there was assumed to be uh, real, so eigenvalues come in complex conjugate pairs, for example, like this. And now the lemma says the following. Uh, if all the eigen, if all the eigenvalues on this critical line, that's this vertical line that determines the spectral gap, are non-defective. With non-defective, I mean the geometric multiplicity is equal to the algebraic multiplicity. This means there are no Jordan blocks. Then there exists a positive definite matrix P such that you have this simple matrix inequality. Let me note this lemma down because that will appear over and over again in the talk. So there exists a positive definite matrix P such that we have the following matrix inequality, larger or equal to mu P. And just to anticipate how to put things into perspective, this constant mu that appears here will end up being the decay rate, the sharp decay rate that we will see in our system. By positivity, you mean what? Positive definite, a positive, strictly positive definite matrix. Uh, if now at least one of the eigenvalues on this critical line is defective, then you lose an epsilon in your uh, matrix inequality, or in other words, you will lose an epsilon in your decay rate. Let me just give you a brief idea of the proof how to construct this matrix P. So I will just show it to you in the non-defective case, which is easier. So take all the eigenvectors of the transpose of your matrix C and sum up all these tensor products here with the complex conjugate of the eigenvalues, then you get one of the possible matrices P. The matrix P is not unique, uh, but the decay rate that you will get in the end will be independent on which P you choose. And if you start with a complex matrix C, there's a simple generalization of this lemma. So then the matrix P will be Hermitian. And here you just take the Hermitian conjugate of your matrix C. So let me now just connect this lemma 
to the decay rate. Uh, the reason I looked at this lemma with and uh, wanted to construct or find such a matrix P was in order to define this problem adapted norm where I put the index P. So take this norm squared and differentiate it along the uh, flow. So if you differentiate the second x, you get here from the OD uh, a C to the right. If you differentiate the first x, you get a C transpose to the left. And here this linear combination of the matrices P and C is exactly what we had in this lemma. So you can estimate this by two mu P. But with the P we are back to the norm, so we have here this differential inequality uh, for the P norm squared. And then Gronwald gives you immediately this exponential decay. So that's really easy. Uh, let me just mention that this idea of defining and constructing problem adapted norms uh, in spirit is nothing new. If you look at the textbook of Pazi, for example, on strongly continuous semigroups, so there, for example, he defines a norm which is the supremum along each individual trajectory uh, in order to make the semigroup in the new norm a contraction. In spirit, this is very similar, although that construction will not give you the sharp rate. Um, let me continue with this very simple example once again, and let me illustrate what is really going on here. So we have a two-dimensional problem. Uh, this blue spiral is just one of the solutions of this ODE. It converges to the origin, of course. And then in this plot, I also have these two black circles, which are, of course, the level curves of the Euclidean norm. So what happens with this blue spiral is that along this solution, the Euclidean norm will always strictly decay unless you are crossing the x2 axis. When you are crossing the x2 axis here, you're tangential to the Euclidean uh, level curve. So there, at that point, the norm does not strictly decay. And therefore, we have seen this wiggly decay of the norm. So, but now, uh, I had introduced this distorted norm with the matrix P. Uh, the, this red ellipse is just the level curve for this distorted norm. And it's constructed in such a way that this blue spiral will always intersect the level curve at a non-trivial angle. So with this modified norm, you will always have a strict decay. And that's what we are after analytically. Uh, let me introduce another concept related to this hypercoercive ODEs. Uh, here is again this uh, simple ODE, but now I split the matrix C into its symmetric and skew symmetric part. So C2 is the dissipative or symmetric part in the matrix. I assume that this matrix is positive semi-definite and I times C1 is now the symmetric part. And I uh, define as the hypercoercivity index of this matrix C, the smallest integer, such that this linear combination of matrices is positive definite. So before looking and trying to digest this sum, let, let me uh, illustrate that in the simplest cases. So simplest case is if the matrix C is not only hypercoercive, but coercive, which was defined as the positive part, which is C2, has to be positive definite. So if the C2 is already positive definite, I don't need all these products with C1, uh, and therefore the index is uh, zero. Uh, if you uh, start with a matrix C2 that is only positive semi-definite, you have to glue from the front and the end these powers of the matrix C1. And if this can be done with finitely many terms here, then I call the matrix C hypercoercive. If this is the case, then for analytic uh, reasons, no, for algebraic reasons, you have an upper and lower bound for this hypercoercivity index. So the key question is, of course, 
why do I introduce that? What's the purpose of this hypercoercivity index? Um, the reason I want to show that to you is that this index describes the complexity of this ODE in the sense it describes the complexity of the interplay between the two parts of the matrices. How complicated is the intertwining of these two parts? So let me illustrate that in another example. And before this example, uh, let me give this simple lemma. A matrix C is hypercoercive if and only if no subspace of the, of the kernel of the matrix C2 is invariant under the other matrix C1. So the purpose or the goal of the matrix C1 in the evolution is to mix up the kernel of C2 with the orthogonal of the kernel, the decaying modes with the non-decaying modes. And C1 should not leave invariant any part of the kernel. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a decay in the whole system. So now, now let's look at the following 4x4 four four system. So the decaying uh, or dissipative part should be a di diagonal matrix with two zeros and two ones. And now the matrix C1 should mix the zeros and the ones. Let's look at this first example. Uh, and let's first look at the first and fourth column and row. So I have this one and this minus one. What uh, is their action? They somehow couple the first mode, which is non-decaying, with the fourth mode that is decaying. Also, let's look at the center two by two part. What is their action? It couples the second zero with the third entry, which is decaying. So therefore, all modes will decay eventually. What you have in this matrix here is you have two parallel couplings between a decaying and a non-decaying mode. Now, by contrast, and in this case, the hypercoercivity index is one. This could be verified by looking at the definition on the previous slide. Now let's look at the second example. Uh, here, let's look at this upper right two by two block. What's the action of that? It mixes the first zero with the second zero, which does not give rise to a decaying mode. Next, let's look at this central two by two block. It mixes again the second zero with the one. So here you have a consecutive coupling of two levels. And therefore, the hypercoercivity index can be verified to be two. So after discussing these ODEs, let me apply this concept on partial dip. Uh, yes, that's very closely uh, connected to the Hermann uh, definition, yes. Um, uh, we had hoped that it would be that simple, but it seems uh, not. There, so in some asymptotic regimes, there seems to be something of this sort true, but in a naive way, it is not true. Or in the naive way, it's for sure, we know of examples where it's false. So the next block is trying to use these ODE concepts now for PDs, and I start with relaxation equations. So uh, I will start with so-called BGK models that refers to these three physicists, and BGK equations are used uh, in gas dynamics or computational fluid dynamics, uh, somehow as a toy model, or they were introduced as a toy model for the Boltzmann equation. So, uh, here on the left-hand side of the equation, we have a free streaming part that somehow the Hamiltonian part should say here, the position variable x will be on the torus in d dimension, velocity will be in whole space, and then on the right-hand side, I have a relaxation operator that acts locally in x. For each fixed x, you have relaxation to a Maxwellian distribution. Uh, this uh, term here, this m with the index f, 
is a highly nonlinear term given here in such a way that this Maxwellian has the same hydrodynamic moments as the solution at that position. So with that, I mean it has the same density with which is the zero order moment in velocity. It has the same mean velocity, which is the first order moment in velocity, same temperature, which is related to the second order moment in uh, velocity. And here in this equation, you have, just like in the ODEs, an interplay of two mechanisms. On one hand, you have a relaxation, which only acts local in position. So this means if you would uh, just skip this first term, you would have relaxation to an equilibrium which has a different temperature and different mean velocity at each position. But then you have this Hamiltonian part which will mix all the different positions and eventually the mixing will give rise to convergence to a uniform, to a constant in X. Maxwellian as the global steady state. And this interplay is what is referred to as hypocoercivity if there's an exponential decay for that. Um, as a very simple toy model for this, such a BGK equation, I start with the first of all 1D problem. I choose only two velocities and I choose a linear model. So here, f is a vector with the two components related to velocity plus and minus one. Here you have the transport in positive and negative direction, and that's now the linear relaxation operator. I, uh, let me recall, everything is periodic in x. So in order to understand this very simple PDE, uh, First of all, the Fourier transform in the x direction, uh, the Fourier modes will be labeled with the index k. And in the velocity direction, I introduce these spaces 1, 1, and 1, minus 1. Um, let me just remark that exactly this model was, for example, looked at by Dorbo, Moore, and Schmeisser with their hypercoercive uh, techniques. They uh, proved exponential decay, but their rate was not sharp. And then uh, shortly afterwards, we revisited this problem and extracted the sharp decay rate. So let me just briefly go through this problem. So what I did was Fourier transform in X. Then you see that each Fourier mode is decoupled. And for each Fourier mode with the index K, you have this very simple ODE with the constant matrix C sub K. Here's the matrix. So for the K equals zero mode, uh, the matrix here is the entry zero and one, which are the eigenvalues. For all the other modes, you have eigenvalues one half plus minus some imaginary part, which tells you the decay rate will be one half for all the higher modes. Steady state for the zero mode is one and zero. So this guy here, the zero eigenvalue will not decay. That corresponds to the steady state. Um, here you have a decay, so it will decay to the origin. So the idea is we'll now treat each Fourier mode separately. And just by following the pattern from the first block of my talk, for each mode, I have to construct uh, the appropriate norm. So for each, uh, mode, I have to introduce a separate matrix PK using this lemma that I've shown you at the very beginning. For the zero order mode, uh, you have an exponential decay rate one, because here you have an eigenvalue one. For all the other modes, you have a decay rate one half because of the real part that appears here. So then, uh, you uh, apply the lemma that uh, is still here on the board and uh, you have for the higher modes the decay rate, one half. So now the idea is to collect or sum up all the modes, all the Fourier modes. Here is uh, here listed how these matrices PK look like explicitly. What is convenient here that as the modes go to infinity, this matrix PK uh, converges to the identity matrix. So the natural Lyapunov functional for the system is sum up all these PK modes for each Fourier mode. And in the end, you want to relate that to the Euclidean norm. Yes? What is the intuition for choosing PK? 
the intuition is that P, PK will uh, give you the sharp rate mu here. So any, any PK that satisfies that you're trying to Yes. Uh, here, if you look through this example, you won't have much choice. You will just, can, you can only choose multiples of that. That will be your only choice. In higher dimensions, you have more flexibility. And then the multiplicative constant will depend on your choice. It may be for a larger system, it will be hard. Here it's simple. So you want to connect it to the Euclidean norm. What is convenient here is that this converges. So since this converges, uh, this specially defined norm is equivalent to the Euclidean norm for all modes. Well, if you have the Euclidean norm, then by Plancherel, you can go back to phase space uh, in position and velocity, and you get, in the end, an estimate for the decay of the Euclidean norm for the sharp decay with the re exponential rate two, and with the best multiplicative constant square root of three, which appears as the numerical condition number of the matrix P1, because you want to exploit, you want to go back and forth between this P norm and the Euclidean norm. So now as a second topic for this BGK relaxation equations, let me still uh, work on a 1D problem, but now I have continuous velocity. So I proceed as before, I consider the spatial Fourier modes. Again, they decouple, but now you have infinitely many velocities. So in velocity, I introduce uh, as a basis Hermit functions. And then in this basis, I have an infinite vector of the coefficients. And for this infinite vector, I denote this with f hat for each fixed Fourier mode. I have the following evolution equation. So that's now actually an infinite ODE. So this matrix L1, here you see the Fourier transform part of the transport operator has this structure and it's an infinite tridiagonal matrix. The dissipative part corresponding to the relaxation term from up here uh, is encoded by this matrix L2, which is this infinite diagonal matrix. All modes decay with the rate minus one, except of the first one, because this, uh, this BGK equation conserves mass. So what do we need to have? We need to have a coupling uh, of this first mode with the second mode that will be introduced by the action of this upper left two by two block. So following the ideas from the previous two uh, velocity BGK equation, what would be nice would be to construct the best matrix P and the best uh, constant mu. But for an infinite matrix, that is really hard. I have no idea how to do that. So as a compromise, I will now give up the quest to find here the best or sharp exponential decay rate. Uh, and I will rather, instead of trying to find this infinite matrix P, I will want to find a simpler approximate matrix P that will at least give me some exponential rate, even if it's not the best one. So I will make the following ansatz for this matrix PK. It's an infinite identity matrix where I replace the upper left two by two block by this ansatz. Why do I do that? Well, it's this upper left two by two block that encodes the coupling between these two modes. And that's what I need. So why do I put in, alpha is an undetermined uh, parameter. I divide here by k because in the equation I multiply here by k, so then that will more or less cancel this multiplicative k. So the goal is now find the best alpha in this ansatz such that this matrix inequality, which is taken from here, uh, gives you the best possible decay rate mu. 
uh, uniform for all Fourier modes, K. Well, that's uh, some uh, algebraic exercise. You can do that, and then you construct these matrices PK. Again, you collect all the spatial Fourier modes, and you have a rather natural Lyapunov functional that will allow you to prove exponential decay. So here's the theorem of what we get. Uh, assume that I fix one temperature, say temperature equal one in my equation, then if I switch back again to uh, phase space here for position and velocity, and everything is weighted with the inverse Gaussian, which is the natural L2 norm to consider, this will decay with the rate, which is some number that you get out of here. And uh, this rate is in fact not that bad, uh, taking into account that this ansatz was rather crude. It is off by a factor roughly 2.5 compared to the true decay rate that we tried to fix by uh, numerical simulations. So as a third BGK model, I will rather be uh, short here. The original BGK equation conserves three macroscopic or hydrodynamic uh, modes, that the mass, momentum, and say temperature. So since it conserves three quantities, uh, we have in, again, if I Fourier transform in uh, velocity and I look at the linearized equation here, here is again the Fourier transpor, uh, transform transport operator. Here is the dissipative part, and this dissipative part now has three zeros that eventually needs to be coupled to the decaying modes. It needs to be coupled to the decaying modes with this tridiagonal matrix L1. So what will happen here if we think back of this hypocoercive structure? First, this mass conservation mode, which doesn't decay, is coupled to the mean velocity mode, which again doesn't decay. This one is coupled to the temperature mode, which again doesn't decay. But this one is finally coupled uh, to the solid dot, which uh, signifies a decaying mode that's a third order mode. So in this one-dimensional BGK equation, you have a hypercoercivity index of three because you have this iterative three-level coupling in the structure. So according to this structure, the uh, somehow natural ansatz for this transformation matrix P uh, would be of this sort. You have the three parameters alpha, beta, and gamma. You plug this into this matrix inequality and adapt alpha, beta, and gamma uh, such that you can find the decay rate mu. What I've illustrated here in one dimension can also be done for two or three dimensions. But in already two dimensions, there's an interesting twist uh, in the hypocoercivity structure. So you have the mass conserved mode, which does not decay. This is coupled to the two velocity modes or momentum modes, which don't decay. Uh, the two velocity modes are coupled to the temperature mode, which does not decay. But this temperature mode is eventually coupled to a third order moment that decays. But in two dimensions, you also have uh, second order modes that already decay. I illustrate it here with this solid dot. So this means uh, you only need two iterative couplings to get to a decaying mode. So this means in two and three dimensions, uh, you have more possibilities in this graph to connect, and therefore the hypercoercivity index drops from three to uh, two. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not talking about the rates here. And uh, uh, it, in, in fact, in comparing uh, these connections, we had an example where including a, another connection reduced the decay rate. So uh, it's not so straightforward to deduce a decay rate from these couplings or from this coupling graph. 
Let me get to the last part of my talk uh, for Kaplan equations, and I will discuss both uh, degenerate and non-degenerate for Kaplan equations. So I will start here with a review block that's uh, really all the material that goes back to Bakri and Demery in essence. And I will start looking at this symmetric or reversible Fokker-Planck equation. So this matrix D, uh, I will assume here for simplicity that this is constant in X. Here I have a confinement potential A of X or a drift uh, potential, uh, F will be a probability density uh, throughout the evolution. The steady state for such a symmetric Fokker-Planck equation uh, is explicit. It's just the exponential of minus the potential that you have in there. Using this steady state, you can write uh, this right-hand side of your equation in this more compact form. You, you have the gradient of the solution over the steady state, and here the diffusion matrix, and here F infinity. In the first part, I will assume that the diffusion matrix is positive definite, so uh, this will be a non-degenerate diffusion equation. And concerning this confinement potential, it has to grow towards infinity. Think of it uh, as asymptotically a quadratic term. Um, I want to estimate somehow the distance between the solution at any time t to the steady state. And I will use here some relative entropy as, uh, say, a non-symmetric distance between two probability densities, and it's defined here as this integral. So I will look at the whole family of relative entropies that are defined by this scalar function psi. Uh, that goes from the positive reals to the positive reals. So these uh, functions psi should be non-negative, they should have a zero at one, they should be strictly convex, and satisfy this technical condition here. So here are some examples of such functions psi. So because of this one and only zero at one, the relative entropy is zero if and only if the two probability densities are the same. So examples would be this logarithmic entropy or Boltzmann entropy, and then power law entropies with the power p, and the power p can range between one and two in order to fulfill this technical assumption. So let me go back to this symmetric Fokker-Planck equation, and we want to use this relative entropy between the solution at time t and the steady state. So first, we differentiate this in time along the uh, flow of the Fokker-Planck equation. So if you plug in the Fokker-Planck equation, integrate by parts once, you can write it as this integral. And it has a sign because psi was convex and the diffusion matrix is positive definite. So the integral is non-negative. And this is uh, referred to as the Fisher information. So we see the relative entropy will be non-increasing. So uh, it satisfies the first criterion for really up and up functional. The goal will be we want to quantify the decay of this relative entropy. Uh, I will now briefly review the so-called entropy method that has become very popular in the last 20 years in PDEs and the, uh, before already in probability. Um, as I said, it goes back to Bakri and Demary, and then, uh, for example, in this reference, you find the PDE rewriting uh, of this story. In this, in this entropy method, you always have two steps. Eventually, you want to prove that the relative entropy decays exponentially. But in the first step, you rather show exponential decay of the entropy dissipation. That's the time derivative of it, or of the Fisher information. And to keep the exposition here simple, assume that this matrix, the diffusion matrix D, is constant in X. So here's the steady state, and we have the following theorem. Let the diffusion matrix and the drift potential satisfy this condition here, referred to also as Bakri and Marie condition. So the Hessian has to be bounded below by a positive multiple of the inverse diffusion matrix. 
So if the diffusion is the identity, then this means the potential has to be uniformly convex. Then uh, you have exponential decay of the Fisher, relative Fisher information, if you like, at time t. Uh, compared to the initial Fisher information with the rate that is determined by this convexity condition. So now the second step of the relative entropy, of the entropy method. There you want to prove uh, exponential decay of the entropy itself. So under the same convexity condition, you get exponential decay of the relative entropy with the same rate as before. And let me just give you a glimpse of the proof. Uh, in the first step, or to prove the first step, you actually work out this differential inequality for the time derivative of the Fisher information. So that guy here is actually the second time derivative of the relative entropy. And you have this differential inequality. So now you take this differential inequality and integrate it in time from t to infinity. Then you remember that the Fisher information was nothing but minus the time derivative of the entropy. And then you get the uh, according differential inequality for the relative entropy. And then by Grandval, you have uh, the exponential decay that you wanted to see. So let me now uh, add the following very simple corollary. So far in this uh, block, I discussed only symmetric Fokker-Planck equations, where the drift term is a pure gradient. Uh, we have already seen yesterday in the talk of Professor Eberle uh, that this is closely connected to non-symmetric Fokker-Planck equations like this guy here. So the only thing I added here was to the gradient term a more general vector field that has to satisfy this divergence-free condition uh, such that by adding this term, the steady state f infinity would be unchanged. So writing or decomposing the drift field into this gradient and non-gradient part uh, gives a separation of the generator into a symmetric and skew symmetric part. And um, here in this corollary, I want to say that exactly the same exponential decay uh, estimate also holds for this general, more general class of Fokker-Planck equations. And there's nothing more you have to prove. It comes for free. Why? Well, if you look at this differential inequality, the relative entropy, uh, of course, doesn't see this term because it's not included there. And then if you compute the time derivative of the relative entropy, uh, you see that the time derivative doesn't see this term either because of this divergence-free condition. So this differential inequality is identical for a symmetric and non-symmetric Fokker-Planck equation. So this result just carries over for free to the non-symmetric Fokker-Planck equations. Uh, let me add some comments on this differential inequality. So here we have a relative entropy. And here we have the entropy dissipation of Fisher information. And uh, this inequality can also be interpreted as a logarithmic Sobolev inequality or weighted Poincaré inequality. So on the previous slide, we had this inequality for any time t. So let me choose, for example, t equals 0. So I have this inequality here. And I write out this inequality, for example, for the logarithmic entropy. So here I have the relative entropy term, and here is the explicit form of the Fisher information. And now we can forget how we proved that, that there was a time evolution with a PDE as a background. Let's just consider this as a functional inequality where F0 is some probability density and F infinity is another one that is log concave such that it satisfies the Bakria-Marie criterion. 
So now let me just rewrite this inequality by substituting f0 over f infinity as f squared. If I do that, I get this inequality here. And it holds for all functions f uh, that satisfy this normalization. And uh, this inequality here in the box is referred to as a logarithmic Sobolev inequality. So what the entropy method provides you with is another proof for the logarithmic Sobolev inequality. So just as an example, uh, if your potential that is related to the steady state is quadratic, then the steady state is just a Gaussian. Uh, the best constant in the Bakri and Marie convexity condition is 1 over a, uh, which I chose here. And if you use that here in this inequality, you get the original first log Sobolev inequality that goes back to Feder Bush or Gross. So let me now go back to Fokker Planck equations. Uh, on this slide, I want to show you the big difference between non-degenerate Fokker-Planck equations and degenerate Fokker-Planck equations. And somehow this is a, one of the key messages of the talk, how different this behavior is. So here on the left-hand side, the red curve is the behavior of the relative entropy as a function of time. It decays nicely as a convex function with this exponential decay. Uh, if you look at the time derivative, that's this dotted uh, curve. It's of course negative. But the key information is the uh, time derivative, the entropy production, is always strictly negative unless you are at the steady state. It can never be zero elsewise. Therefore, it's possible that we have a differential inequality between the Fisher information and the relative entropy. Here on the right hand side, I show you the typical behavior of the relative entropy as a function of time in a degenerate Fokker Planck equation. You see again this wavy behavior that we already saw in, in ODEs. So it's not convex. So here the dotted curve is again the time derivative. You see it's zero here, zero here. So the entropy production is zero also at states that are not a steady state, which has a consequence that such a differential inequality must be wrong in general. But this was the key for the entropy method. So this means the standard entropy just cannot work for a degenerate equation. So let me now fix the class of degenerate equations I want to discuss. Uh, here I will look uh, at linear Fokker-Planck equations with the linear drift given by this matrix C. And here it is constant diffusion matrix D that is now positive semi-definite. First condition I impose is uh, that no subspace of the kernel of the uh, matrix D uh, should be invariant under the matrix C transpose. This sounds very much like the interplay of the matrices C1 and C2 in the ODE case. And this condition, whoops, this condition is exactly equivalent to the Hermander condition for the operator L to be hypoelliptic. So therefore, we have an instantaneous regularization. The solution gets instantaneously strictly positive. Um, but I will need a second condition. On top of that, I also need that the drift matrix here is positively stable, which amounts to essentially saying that the drift, that there is a drift potential that is confining, such that your uh, system cannot run away off to infinity in some direction. So the punchline of my assumptions will be, I assume hypoellipticity and confinement, and this will give us hypo uh, coercivity, which is exponential decay to the steady state. Uh, next topic is the steady state. Here I can be quick because this was already covered yesterday afternoon. So for this equation, uh, the steady state is a non-isotropic Gaussian with a covariance matrix K that is the solution of this continuous Lyapunov equation, exactly under the uh, conditions that I had on the previous slide. Uh, once you have this uh, 
steady state in this Gaussian form, you can introduce a coordinate transformation, think of a stretching and a rotation, such that uh, the Gaussian becomes the standard Gaussian with covariance matrix identity. If you introduce this normalization, then in parallel the diffusion matrix turns out to be the symmetric part of the drift matrix. So to keep notation simple, I assume I'm now, from now on, always in this normalized setting. So I said before, the problem with uh, degenerate Fokker-Planck equations is the entropy dissipation can be zero for states other than the steady state. So here is the standard Fisher information, here the diffusion uh, matrix, and this is only positive semi-definite, so if this gradient here uh, lies in the kernel of this matrix, it will already be zero, and so that Lyapunov functional is not really useful uh, to build an entropy method on that. Therefore, I uh, tune this functional slightly. The structure stays the same, so I just introduce somehow out of the blue a new functional where I only replace this positive semi-definite matrix by a positive definite matrix P. And the goal is for this new functional, again I want to have a differential inequality between this functional and its time derivative. Uh, if I'm able to find such a functional for an appropriate choice of a matrix P, then I have exponential decay for this functional, which has no uh, canonical meaning for the original equation. But since I can bound from below the matrix P by the diffusion, diffusion matrix with some constant, once this modified functional decays exponentially, also the Fisher information will decay exponentially. And this is what I really want. So I told you in my review part, the entropy method comes always in two steps. First, you want to prove exponential decay of the entropy dissipation and afterwards of the entropy itself. So let's uh, use the following auxiliary functional with the matrix P that is again taken from this algebraic lemma that I had from the very beginning. And the constant mu that appears here is again the spectral gap of the matrix C. And the matrix C is now the drift matrix in your Fokker-Planck equation. So for that we have the following result. Under some uh, technical assumptions on the initial condition, uh, if all the eigenvalues of your matrix C on this critical line are not defective, then you have exponential decay of this modified functional with the sharp rate mu. If you do have some defects on the critical line, you lose an epsilon in the decay rate. So the spectral gap of the drift matrix is transformed to the uh, decay rate of your Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, let me uh, just give you an idea of the proof. So again, you have to differentiate in time this modified functional, capital S. So after some work, you can write it in two terms, and the main term is this guy here, where the U denotes the gradient of F, the solution F over the steady state. And there you just happen to find this linear combination of the matrices that we have seen from the very beginning. So since the matrix P was constructed according to this inequality, I can use here this matrix inequality. And it is this step which replaces the standard bacria marie condition in uh, the standard entropy method. And then you get some additional term, with this, a remainder term, which is, has a sign and which can be dropped. So I will skip the discussion of this remainder term. And uh, now that we have seen exponential decay of the entropy dissipation, the second step of the entropy method is to infer from that exponential decay of the entropy itself. So let us just recall what we did in the standard approach. Uh, there we had exponential decay of the time derivative, 
We integrated in time the differential inequality and we could immediately get exponential decay of the entropy. We cannot do that here. Because remember, the S functional is not a time derivative of the entropy. It was just invented. Still, we ha I have the following uh, differential inequality. So here is the relative entropy of the solution with respect to the steady state. And here I have an exponential decay term with some concept that depend on the initial condition with the rate that is the spectral gap of the drift matrix and the reduced rate if there's some defect. So in this box here with the two inequalities, the right inequality is what we already know from the first step. So the question is only how do we get this left inequality? So let me just briefly illustrate the proof of that. The idea of the proof is to cook up an auxiliary symmetric Fokker-Planck equation. That a priori has nothing to do with the evolution that we want to study. So that's this Fokker-Planck equation for the function g. And I manufacture it in the way that it has the same steady state as my original equation, g infinity is equal to f infinity, which is the standard Gaussian. And I put as the drift matrix of this uh, for Kaplan equation here, the, uh, the matrix P that I've used in my auxiliary functional. Why do I do that? Well, for this equation here, I can look at the Bacria Marie condition. Potential A is here this quadratic term, the Hessian is the identity. I can bound this below with the inverse of this drift matrix. So this tells us this auxiliary matrix, uh, differential or auxiliary Fokker-Planck equation has solutions that decay exponentially with the rate given with this lambda p. And I've told you that exponential decay of a symmetric Fokker-Planck equation parallels the validity of a logarithmic Sobolev inequality or a convex Sobolev inequality. These are just two faces or two aspects of the same issue. So here is the convex Sobolev inequality. That's an inequality between the relative entropy and the corresponding entropy dissipation. The corresponding entropy dissipation for this auxiliary equation is just the S functional that I had up there. So this Functional inequality is just the term, the missing term that I put here on the left-hand side. And this then completes the proof of this uh, uh, decay estimate. So on one hand, as I still have some minutes, on one hand, you could say, well, I have achieved my goal, exponential decay of the relative entropy, everything is done. But it's, the estimate is ugly, because here of the relative entropy, here I have a higher order functional that involves derivatives somehow, like a weighted uh, H1 norm. This can be improved. Here's the improved version. Uh, the relative entropy at time t can be estimated exponentially by, on the right-hand side, just the relative entropy at the initial time by exploiting the fact that we are dealing here with a parabolic equation that regularizes, although it's degenerate. So the spirit of the proof is very easy. I want to prove, uh, estimate the relative entropy. Um, by this functional inequality, I can estimate it with the entropy dissipation. For this, we have exponential decay in time. But now I don't go back until the initial time. I leave some initial time layer. And in this initial time layer, I use the parabolic regularization. And that gives rise to this decay. So for what I've discussed so far, you could object that it's all very nice that I have this exponential decay. But the type of equations are such that you can write down an explicit Green's function. And from that, you can extract, of course, the exponential decay rate. And you, of course, write. So therefore, let me give you an example where there's no explicit Green's function. This is a kinetic Fokker-Planck equation where the confinement potential here is now non-quadratic. 
Still, you can write down the, uh, the steady state. It factors in a velocity-dependent uh, term and in an x-dependent term. And you can now rewrite this equation here, which is degenerate because diffusion is only in velocity in half of the variables in this compact form. So these two diagonal terms are the diffusion matrix, and you see it's degenerate. So here uh, we have uh, still an exponential decay uh, for the relative entropy. And uh, the game is you can give up uh, a little bit of the decay rate that you, and the potential is a quadratic potential plus a perturbation. Uh, so you can give up a bit of the decay rate from the quadratic term and use that to cover your uh, perturbation. Uh, to come soon to the end of my talk, uh, let me give you one more example for a non-symmetric Fokker-Planck equation and it's now a non-degenerate equation. So for a non-degenerate equation, we have two entropy methods that would work. Say the old one and this new hypercoercive one. Let me just compare that. So we are, our goal is to find exponential decay estimates of this sort. So the old standard entropy method that was devised originally for uh, symmetric Fokker-Planck equations gives you a local decay rate with a rate uh, one quarter. So the red curve, this wiggly curve, is the true decay of uh, the relative entropy. And this blue dotted curve is perfect here at the initial time, but for larger times it's really uh, overestimating the behavior very much. By contrast, this hypercoercive method, uh, the estimate is this dashed line. So it gives you a very nice envelope of the true behavior. So, and it gives you a global decay rate. So in the price you pay is at the initial time you have to overshoot a bit because you have to cover or compensate for these wiggles. And globally it gives you a much better decay rate than here. So this looks pretty nice. There's just one qu main question one may ask. Why does this work rather nicely? So this will be my last slide. Uh, so in these Fokker-Planck equations, you're dealing with a non-symmetric generator. Still, this Fokker-Planck operator has a sequence, a complete sequence of mutually orthogonal uh, eigenspaces in this weighted L2 space. So if you decompose the evolution in these eigenspaces, in the first eigenspace, your evolution of a vector of length n is just determined by the drift matrix. If you go to the second subspace, uh, it's higher dimensional, think of a matrix. The evolution is determined by this matrix, uh, by this ODE. You have to put the matrix C, still the same matrix from both sides. And if you go to higher order uh, subspaces, you need to look at tensored versions of that. But it will still always be only the matrix C. So the idea is the sharp decay of this simple ODE, which derives from the drift equation, carries over to the full sharp L2 decay of the Fokker-Planck equation. Once you knew, use the norm P that is given by this lemma. The spirit that you see here uh, is very reminiscent of second quantization. I will not go into details. So let me just flash up a conclusion. We've started with this simple lemma for ODEs here. And I've shown you how you can use these concepts first for relaxation equations and of various levels of complication, and then for hypercoercive Fokker-Planck equations. And here you have some references for Fokker-Planck equation and these relaxation equations. So I'm sorry that I took some minutes more. Thank you for your attention.
Would it make sense to apply the entropy method to this Goldstein Taylor uh, model or, or the, the DJK model? Uh, I, I would say n not in a non-modified form. So uh, you, I, I would say these entropy methods uh, have become very successful, and but for each equation you have to fine tune and, and adapt it. So uh, to use or to consider the, in the entropy method, the idea was look first at the differential inequality between the second and the first time derivative. And for these BGK or relaxation models or Goldstein-Taylor, I didn't see any need to look at the second time derivative. There, the first time derivative already did the job. So I would say for all of equations, including nonlinear equations, you have to slightly modify the approach and the functional that you, that you look at. Thank you very much. Thank you.